our real beliefs are what we live by. Real belief and knowing are one. When a man really believes, it's just as though he knows it. It's tantamount to knowing. So when I tell you belief, I call it faith, I call it belief, it is not complete till it becomes experience. One must experience it, and then they know it. Now, you will hear the same thing tonight. Everyone present will hear exactly the same thing. But no two will hear it in the same depth. Some will hear it on the surface. Others will hear it below the surface. And others will hear it down in the very depths of their being. It's where you hear it. As we are told... The word came to them as it did to us. But it did not profit them, because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard it. They heard it and rejected it, but they heard it. It came in and went out. It did not receive acceptance by those who heard it. And so they instantly rejected it. Tonight, I hope you will not reject well, I'm here to tell you. But that's your choice. You're free. You could accept it or reject it. But I tell you, if I get through tonight and you apply it, because you are the operant power, I can tell you that it doesn't operate itself. At this very moment, I ask you to think of a friend. Just think of a friend. And now hear him tell you something lovely, something lovely about himself, about a mutual friend, or about you. Just hear it. Do you believe that that actually took place? You may say, well, I imagined it, but it didn't really take place. I will tell you the day will come, and I hope now, that when you imagine a state before you have external confirmation of that state, to you, it is as though you heard it externally. You know it. That this internal act is equal to the external confirmation of that act. You get to that point. Because the difference between God and man is measured only in terms of this imaginative power. If I would now speak of the power that is God, as we are told in Scripture, is revealed constantly as power, sheer power. Third chapter, fourth, fifth, and sixth verses of the book of Exodus. Sheer power. Moses stands in the presence of power, but it's creative power. And the distance between God and man is measured by simply power. On this level, if I'm on the surface of my being, only this is real. And what my senses allow. But as I go deeper into my own being, moving ever towards the core of my being, who is God, then my imaginative act becomes externalized. Quickly externalized as I go deeper and deeper. On the surface, it seems to take an interval of time. If I believe. If I don't believe, it never comes into some external form at all. Never. Yet I'm living in a world, not understanding it, not knowing what it's all about. So really the story that I want to tell you is trying to ask you and plead with you to buy your religion wholesale. Go to the maker. Go to the source. Don't buy it retail. There's some man in between. No one in between you and the source. You go right into the depth. And buy your, whole, your religion wholesale by going to the source, which is your own wonderful human imagination, your own I amness. That's God. The story we told you last Tuesday of one whose name was Eddie. 
And he had the identical experience of the one recorded in the book of Exodus. When he heard, do not come up here, read the words. The words are, do not come here. Read it in the book of Exodus. Fourth, fifth, and sixth verses of the third chapter of Exodus. And the Lord said unto Moses, do not come here. And then Moses hid his face, not in shame, but in fear. He was afraid to look at God. So Eddie saw the symbol of God, and he ran. He was scared too. The identical story. And what did he hear? The revelation of God's name, I am. He first heard it, I am. No one in sight. Then it repeated itself so loudly he thought it came from above. He looked up thinking of some machine, maybe some helicopter, where the PA system is broadcasting the name I am. There was not a thing in sight. And then the third, don't come up here. Being curious, he did go up there to the hill to confront a rattlesnake. Fortunately, it was not called a spring. It was simply a four-foot-long snake all stretched out. The symbol of the creative power of God. But it scared him. It scares man. The man actually sees what really is in himself. That he's solely responsible for everything that's taking place in his world. Solely responsible. It scares him. It's too much. Until he goes deeper and deeper and hears the same word of truth, but hears it in depth. And then he assumes full responsibility for all that is taking place within him. So tonight, let me share with you a few stories. Seven years ago, a lady, she's not here tonight, she's now on a new job, and is taken away for a while. But when she heard it, that imagining creates reality, she said to herself, but if that is so, I would like to go to Egypt. She had no money. She's never been a lady of means, always working, small sums of money, could never accumulate what it would take to make the trip. And so, the usual story, she told her dream. She didn't keep it to herself, she told it. Nothing wrong in it. If you really believe it, you can tell it. As you're told in the scripture, go, tell no man, but show John, show the world. Well, that's, if you don't tell man before, will man believe you after the event? He may question your honesty. But if you tell him before the event, then he is assured because actually you have a witness to the fact you did tell him before the event. So that is also in scripture. And now I will tell you before it takes place that when it does take place, you may believe. For that is courage in the depth of the soul, where one knows the imaginal act is a fact at the very moment of the act, though not yet seen by the outer man. But not everyone has that courage and that faith in the imaginal act. So she told it. And naturally her friends criticized her. It is stupid to go to that man, you waste your money. It's not religion, what is it? He is telling you that an assumption, though false, if persisted in, will harden into fact? Well, that's stupid. It doesn't make sense. To them, a true judgment must conform to the external fact to which it relates. So if I say, well, isn't a lovely dog, and there is no dog to bear witness to my judgment, my judgment is false. So that's what they gathered from what she told them that I am teaching. And so the whole thing is insane, it's stupid. Well, the years went on. It's been seven years now. And this is what happened this past week. She got a job. She's a nurse, and so the job moves around. She goes from home to home where the need is there. And so she found herself in the environment or the neighborhood of a friend she had not seen or contacted in a year. She had exchanged a birthday card and a Christmas greeting with a little note on the card, but no telephone call and no other contact. Finding herself in the neighborhood, she calls her. When the strain heard her voice on the wire, she said, Oh, Jan, 
You can have it. You can have it. He said, all right, all right, I'll take it. What is it? And then this is the story. There was a party, a pre-Lenten party at the hotel at Hilton. Some Mardi Gras by a Catholic society, the Joseph and Mary Society. There were dough prizes. The major prize was a 30-day trip, first class, all expenses paid, stopping along the way at the Hilton Hotels in the Near East. And Egypt is part of the setup. The lady and her family had spent several months last year abroad and had no desire this year to go abroad again. In fact, they've already arranged to go to New York City for the World's Fair, which opens in April. So a trip abroad is out. Furthermore, this ticket, this door ticket, only accepts one person, not a group, not a family. <coughs> so that was what her friend said to her she would give her. <coughs> Jan said, all right, I'll take it. And then called me up to tell me the story. Delayed, seemingly, seven years. She still now has her ticket, if she wants it, to the Near East, where Egypt is included, and she goes first class, all expenses paid, but everything paid. Because she believed, maybe in the interval her faith wavered, maybe she justified it by saying, maybe I don't want it, or in some strange way tried to explain it away. But it still, in its own good time, came to the surface. I ask you not to throw your dreams away and feel that they are impossible of realization in this strange, drab world of external facts. Every dream can come true if I can get through to you that your imagination is God, and that your imaginal act, when you think of a friend carrying on a conversation, that is Jesus Christ in action. Examine yourselves to see whether you are holding to your faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? If he is in you, then who is he? He is your own imagining. God is your imagination. God in action is imagining. And God in action is Christ. Christ, as defined in Scripture, is the power and the wisdom of God. So I tell you, everyone can realize if you really believe in Jesus Christ. One billion will claim they believe in Jesus Christ and cross themselves before a dead piece of wood or a piece of marble or clay or something other than a living God. And the very being kneeling before these external icons, here was the king of Greece had just died, and they brought what they considered a holy icon for the man who has died. In the eyes of God, a king is just like a serf. They do not differ. One's love for one is not greater than his love for another. To what extent have they heard the word of God and believed? So he's dying to bring a holy icon. It didn't work. They saw the little icon, and so he makes his exit like any other person in the world. I hope that everyone here will find the real Jesus Christ. The real Jesus Christ is your own wonderful human imagining. That's God in action. The real God is your own wonderful, lovely imagination. When you say, I am, that's God.